Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and we are glad you are with us for this week's episode of Living Divine Mercy here on EWTN, the show that brings you stories and teachings about God's most important attribute of mercy. Now, one of the most popular hobbies of people around the world today is sports. It has a huge impact on our physical, social, and emotional lives. But what kind of place should we allow sports to have in our lives as Catholics? We are so what does the Catholic Church teach about sports? Well, many say, for example, that the National Football League violates the Sabbath by playing games on Sunday, and therefore it is sinful to watch these games or even go to them. So, is this true? Well, like anything, it depends on how we view sports. If sports to us are just a casual way to relax and enjoy the company of others after uh, the proper worship of God and the fulfillment of our duties are done, it can be a positive thing. But if it becomes an idol to us, keeping us from Sunday worship and we miss mass because we are home trading fantasy football players, then there could be a problem. So, what does the church say about sports? St. Augustine said, Playfulness has its proper time, place, and mode. Insofar as we play reasonably, we can speak of the virtue of playfulness, and therefore a virtue related to games. Through games, we restore the strength of our souls so as to be more fervent in pursuing higher ends such as contemplation." End quote. Okay, so the next time your spouse yells at you for watching football or playing hockey, you can tell her that it's preparing you for a deeper life of prayer. Now, did you know that St. Paul often referenced sports as well, comparing our life on earth to a race in 2 Timothy and to a time of discipline in 1 Corinthians. What he points out, however, is that while the athlete competes for a perishable crown, Christians compete for an imperishable crown. You know, the Bible describes us as being in a stadium where the souls in heaven are watching us like spectators as we are running a race. That's a race we want to finish. And like an athlete, we must train for a life of virtue and dedication, not just for the body, but also for the soul. You know, John Paul II said, it's a fitting occasion to give thanks to God for the gift of sport, in which we, the human person, exercises his body, intellect, and will recognizing these abilities as so many gifts of his creator. Playing sports has become very important today since it can encourage young people to develop important values such as loyalty, perseverance, friendship, sharing, and solidarity." End quote. Now, other great virtues we learn through sports are charity and humility the king virtues. You know, in team sports, we learn the value of teammates and how we need the help of others. In 1997, in the NBA Finals, everyone expected Michael Jordan to take the last shot. But he actually won the admiration of all of his teammates when he said, no, Steve Kerr will take it. Kerr did, and the Bulls won the championship. You know, humility is another great virtue to be learned through sports. I remember my sophomore year on JV in high school, I didn't lose a wrestling match and my football team didn't lose a single game. It would have been really easy to become prideful coming back as a junior, right? Well, that year, God allowed me to be on a losing football team and to get thumped in a few wrestling matches. So it ended up being a great lesson in humility. And did you know the Vatican even has spoken about sports? And it's even timely with the events that now are occurring in Russia and Ukraine. In the Vatican document, Giving the Best of Yourself, a document on the Christian perspective on sport and the human person, it says, quote, 
The dynamic of sport is the opposite of that of war, which takes place when people believe that cooperation is no longer possible and when there is a lack of agreement on fundamental rules. The common experience of sacrifice in sport can also help believers understand more fully their vocation as children of God, end quote. Wow, I never thought of it that way before. But this Vatican document even speaks about Sundays when it says, quote, if sport runs the risk of being the occasion to divide a family and to diminish the sanctity of Sunday as the holy day to uphold, it also can help integrate a family with other families in the celebration of Sunday, not only in the liturgy, but then in the life of the community. This does not mean that sport matches should not take place on Sundays, but rather such events must not excuse families from attending Mass and should also promote the life of the family within the community." End quote. And finally, my favorite part of this document says, priests should be encouraged to be reasonably knowledgeable about contemporary sports, realities, and trends, especially as they affect youth, and to link sports with faith and homilies when it makes sense, end quote. Ah, I bet you didn't know that, so don't be too quick to criticize your priest if he mentions sports in his homily. Now, let's sit down with one of the greatest college football coaches of all time, most known for winning the national championship at Notre Dame. You know, I have always rooted for Coach Lou Holtz and his teams, of course, unless they were playing my alma mater, the University of Michigan. Now, here is a great conversation with the Catholic coach, Lou Holtz. Well, thank you so much, Coach Holtz. We are uh, an honor and a uh, pleasure and a privilege to meet with you as one of the greatest, uh, not only football coaches, college football coaches in history, but in my knowledge and in, in learning of you, one of the great Catholics. The best sermon I ever heard, Father, was I was coaching at uh, University of South Carolina, and after 9-11, we played the first football game ever played nationally after 9-11. We played Mississippi State. We flew there. We have uh, a chapel service the night before a game. And Adrian Dupre got up, and I'll never forget, he said to our team, he said, on 9-11, a lot of brave people went into a home, mm -hmm. uh, into the burning buildings, and saved people's lives. He said, how great it must be to save somebody's life. He then said, think how much greater it is to save somebody's soul. Yeah. To save a life is for a few years, a soul's forever. So congratulations on the ordination that you have chosen and the difference you make in people's lives. So, well, thank you, thank you uh, Coach Holtz. And, and, you know, speaking of, you know, we know what a great family man you were. And if you if you don't mind sharing with us, uh, your wife was an amazing lady, Beth. Oh, she was a very special person. And uh, we went to church every Sunday as a family, in season, out of season, et cetera. And we always believed that the most important thing that we could do was take our children to heaven with us. But she was such a religious lady. She was a convert and before I met her. She never really had much faith growing up in her family. But when she went to Pittsburgh to be an x-ray technician, she lived with three girls who were all Catholic. And she was impressed with their faith. And so she converted to Catholicism. See how important it is to live our faith. Oh, it, it really is. And, and so she had a prayer room where the crucifix and everything, and she would read the Bible and pray to God and uh, pray for her children, et cetera. And she's the most religious person that, that I know. And as I said, that I don't know of anybody who loved God more than their children but Beth was certainly one of them. And a great inspiration in your life. If you wouldn't mind, share the story, Coach, that uh, you had a fire, a tragic fire in the house. Well, what, what happened is uh, it was June 22nd, 2015. I was awakened at 2.30 in the morning, and uh, the house was on fire. It was hit by lightning. What, what happened in, in the house before it burnt 
downstairs, she had a whole bookcase of Catholic books, Bibles, etc. When the house burned down, everything was burnt except the bookcase <laughs> with all our Catholic books. Because what happened? The fire started upstairs, and when the upper floor collapsed, it came up and created a wall against that bookcase or books. Uh, there were maybe fifty books. The books were not burnt. The only thing in the That's house that amazing. was not burnt. And I said, "You talk about a miracle." Well, God bless you, Coach. Now, if I may ask, the role of your faith in your your life. It sounds like from many years ago has been important to you. And one of the things that impresses me uh, is when a, I see a Catholic not just believe, but as the scriptures tell us, to live our faith. And that's why our show's called Living Divine Mercy. And one thing, Coach, I wanted to ask you about, because it's so important today, is the pro-life movement. And you're one that has been vocal about that and the importance of standing up for life. Tell us briefly about uh, what that means to you in the pro-life and the importance of, of, of life. Well, my oldest granddaughter was adopted at birth. And it's amazing how people can say that is just tissue. Yeah. In about 14 days, a baby's heart starts beating. Yeah. We, we have to stand up for what we believe. We have to stand up for the unborn because we're God. the only voice that they possibly have. And, and God bless you for that, Coach Holtz, because, you know, God sometimes doesn't always use the great movie stars and politicians and even athletes sometimes, but sometimes he does. And you're an example of that. I, I also laugh when I said, being a Michigan graduate, uh, uh, how to bring up the heartbreak to you, but Elvis Gerback, who uh, threw that fourth down touchdown to Desmond Howard when Michigan won against you 91. You know, he's a deacon today in the Catholic well, Church. I, I, that's wonderful he did that. I remember <laughs> that game vividly. <laughs> and, you know, and we look back now, and sports is an important part. And, you know, I've done talks on sports and, and whatnot, and there is a place for it in our lives. But what makes it so beautiful, Col Coach Holtz, is the story I hear from your former players. Let me give you an example. If you remember George Streeter, he was one of your defensive oh, yeah, he, backs. He was a defensive back. Yes, he actually worked for me in my business in North Carolina. Oh. And um, what an amazing man George Streeter was. He was an inspiration to me, to others in the office. But how you formed those players, how they saw your faith affected them, not just during their playing days, but years into being fathers, into being husbands. And um, I think one of the stories George told me, and, and tell me if this is true, but uh, there was a priest giving an invocation at a dinner before one of the football games, I think it was Miami. And he said, well, remember coach, uh, you know, God doesn't care who's gonna win this game. Tell us what you, how you answered that. Well, what happened, it was the lunch before the Miami game and 3,000 people and I have three athletes going to get up and talk about their experience at Notre Dame. <clears throat> And I walk in at the last second, the priest gets up to give the invocation. He said, uh, Coach Holt, I'm Father Leo, I'm a Catholic priest, I'm the team chaplain of Miami, and we're here to win the game. And I honestly don't believe in God cares who wins the game, let us pray it. When I get up, I, I said, Father, I agree with you. God doesn't care who wins the game, but I promise you, his mother has great interest in the outcome of this game. But, you know, one of the great things about coaching at Notre Dame has never been mentioned is I could talk about my faith to the players. Yes. We could pray before and after a game. We went to mass every, uh, every before every single game. Yeah, that's and, wonderful. Uh, as I told the players, not all of them were Catholic, but when we recruit them, you will go to mass. You don't have to participate, wonderful. but you will show utmost respect for it. And here you are as a coach taking these 18, 19, 20-year-old kids and instilling in them discipline, um, uh, responsibility, love for one another. How did you find, was your Catholic faith at the root of that? And how did you find effective ways to do such a challenging task? I only had three rules. Rule number one, do what's right. You know the difference between right and wrong? And if you have any doubt, get out the Bible. I don't think it's right to find a teammate's wallet before he lost it. Mm -hmm. That's called stealing. Mm -hmm. Rule number two, I expect you to do everything to the very best of your ability. 
-hmm. Not everybody be all America, not everybody be all conference, but everybody can be the best they can be. Not everybody be an A student, but you can be the best you can be. Mm -hmm. And in rule number three, I expect you to show people you genuinely care. You're never going to meet anybody again the rest of your life that doesn't need a smile, a kind word, an encouragement. And if we can build a love and an understanding, everybody's got problems. And fo Coach, that's a beautiful point that I'd like to expand on because as a coach, you've experienced many highs, many lows in those disappointments. Don't you believe, I think as you're saying, those help build character, not just uh, a, a disappointments for the sake of hurting feelings. You, you learn, you grow from that. I, I'm an old man, but the one thing I've learned in all my years, you're always going to have challenges. You're always going to have problems. You're never going to be free where nothing is on your mind or there isn't a difficulty that you have to face in your life. And what I think is with millennials, I'd be a better coach today than I've ever been before, even with the millennials, because it's a leader. The most important thing you have to do as a leader is to set high standards. What you have to do, but don't lower the standard. It was what he said to me once when I coached there that your obligation as a coach is not to be well-liked, is to make them the best they can be. So I'll never forget, he said, you want a friend, buy a dog. And thank you, Coach, for saying that because a lot of people a lot of times say as a Catholic priest, you should favor entitlements and you should favor the welfare system. And sometimes it is needed. Sometimes we understand that. But sometimes, Coach, I believe that it's maybe not what's best for the people. It, it's, it's teaching some responsibility and holding some accountability, always in love, but to do that. Well, we have to go back to our upbringing. I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, so you have to take that for granted. But I was born in a cellar during the Depression by Dr. McGraw. We, had, we lived in a cellar. We had two rooms. One bedroom for my sister, myself, and my parents. We had a kitchen. We had a half bath. The half bath did not have a tub, a shower, or a sink. Mm. We had no refrigerator, no ice box. And we lived there seven and a half years. There was no welfare. There was no food stamps. There was no safety net. And why I was born with a silver spoon was not because of what we had, uh -huh. but because of what I was taught. Wow. I was taught that I was lucky because I was born in this country. Yes. I was God born bless. to be a Catholic and have a faith in God. Yeah. And I was born in a country, if I made good choices, got an education, and understand that whatever happens in my life is going to be because of the decisions that I make. And to me, if you feel that you are being, uh, that, that you're in an environment that, people put you in. In other words, you're being oppressed a victim. because of somebody else. If you have that victim mentality, then you're going to feel the only way you can get out is other people have to help you out. Yeah. But if you understand you are where you are because of choices you make, then you will understand you can get yourself yes. out of it. God bless and you. we're going in the wrong direction yes. where everybody is going to rely on the government and yes. they have all power. All I want is, is let me make my own choices. Yes. And, and over COVID, I, I said, don't keep me alive by keeping me from living. Yes. Let me make those choices yes. as I go on. I would like to ask you to finish. What was your greatest memory on the college football field? I have to finish with that question. What was your greatest memory? You won a national championship in, in well, 1988. You but know, it's hard to pick out the greatest victory, the best player, et cetera. I, I just been blessed for so many things. But the relationship with the players, to, yeah. to watch a player come in as a freshman, insecure, to watch them grow and develop, become a leader, uh, to move on. And to look at the transformation in those athletes during those years. And even some of your greatest athletes, like Tim Brown, strong man in his faith and others. So you've 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 impacted not just uh, the average player, but some of the greatest players. I, I think you give me far too much credit. Much of it goes to their family and their friends and their associates. All I ever tried to do was follow those three rules, Father. And yeah. as long as I follow those three rules, things are going to work out very well. Well, thank you, Coach Holtz. It's been, again, an honor, a privilege, and the world needs many more Coach Lou Holtzes. And uh, yeah. praise be to God that we still 
can look to you as a great example in this crazy world, but yet one in need of those perfect example of those three rules. Mm -hmm. So thank you to all of you for viewing this with us and uh, keep in, in your prayers all of our uh, people who are involved with the young shaping and formation of our youth. It's so important today. Thank you, Coach Holtz, and God bless you. Thank he you. Has. God thank bless you, you, Father. Thank you. As Miriam Priest and brothers, some of us were past athletes, myself and Father Anthony Russell, but one of the best athletes we have in our community is Father Tyler. He had quite an amazing college baseball career, so let us talk a little bit with him about the role of sports in the life of our faith. Yes, it was a great gift and a great blessing in my life to be able to play baseball in my college years at Philadelphia University. Hard work definitely went into my baseball career there in, in Philadelphia University. And I remember getting up probably about six days a week and just hitting the gym, run, running and, and doing a lot of weightlifting and, you know, I field in ground ball after ground ball after ground ball, hundreds and thousands of ground balls and repetition in the in the tee and cage work with with hitting because of the, those hard hard work and, and all those the, that time and effort that I put into it, of course, with with the Lord's grace and his gift first and foremost. But I did have many successes in college in my senior year, which was far and away my, my best year, I was the MVP of our team, and I was also the player of the year, the conference player of the year in our, our college conference. And so you know, the Lord abundantly blessed me in my college career and I had a couple of scouts at several games kind of looking around and, and asking about me and, and uh, scouts for the major leagues and, and some minor league teams. And so I had, had many blessings and, and successes in my career as a baseball player. It's critically important that you just keep practicing, you keep uh, stepping into those mechanics, those, those, uh, those mus that muscle memory that you, whether it's your, your baseball swing or, or your, your pitching or fielding a ground ball or whatever it is in sports, or hitting, hitting a golf ball, you know, just, just practicing, and you get the mechanics down, and then once you just keep doing that, and you just know where your body and your hands and everything's gonna be, then when you get into the game, you're not thinking of the mechanics. It's just there, it's just in your body, it's in your muscles, it's that memory built up over all those times of repetition, repetition and practice, and that's very much like our faith. You know, when we have these good habits that we build up, these good virtues that we're trained in, you know, that we, we keep doing them day after day after day, making these good resolutions and growing in the ways that we, you know, whether it's patience or whether it's kindness or it's chastity or it's self-control or it's courage or it's all the different virtues, humility, purity, and it becomes a part of us. Our life becomes a prayer. Our life becomes friendship, dialogue, conversation, being in the presence of God. And so there's a very ready connection between sport and faith in this idea of repetition. We can also see it clearly in our failures and successes. Sports, we have very clearly, sometimes you fail, sometimes you lose, and sometimes you win. As the saying goes, you know, you win some, you lose some. But that's very true. And sports brings this out in a very strong way. There's a very unfortunate uh, mentality, I think, going around that everybody's a winner. Everybody gets a trophy. That's not true. It's not true in sports. You're competing. There's a prize. There's one winner. Only one person comes out on top and somebody loses and somebody wins. But that's the reality of life.
That's the reality of the job, job market. That's the reality of so many things in life. But that's also the reality in the spiritual life, that we are in a spiritual battle, that we can fall and, and lose some battles, but we can also have good successes, victories, and we can have great, uh, uh, we can win on certain occasions, but ultimately it's that victory of salvation. The Lord wins for us, but we cooperate with it. And so I think sports teaches us there are, there are high stakes. And it's important that, like St. Paul says, there are many runners in the race, but only one wins the prize. And so run so as to win. So sports brings out that competitive fire in us to want to be generous, to be intense in our self-giving, and not only to be a good ball player, a good swimmer, a good tennis player, a wrestler, but to be a good person, to be a good man or, or woman, son and daughter of God, to be holy, and ultimately to win that final victory of eternal salvation. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And please be with us next week as we talk about the most misunderstood and forgotten member of the Trinity, that being the Holy Spirit. So until then, may Almighty God bless you and your family in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.